So welcome back everyone to the second session. I don't think we have um, any new faces other than some of the presenters. Uh, so I won't give a, a, a big introduction, but just to say this is um, a second um, panel that uh, Tom and I have convened around our work for the Future Dams program. we have been looking at the, the politics of electricity in Ghana and Ethiopia over the last three years. So. Going to have two presentations, no, three presentations on on uh, Ethiopia, followed by um, two by Future Dams researchers, and then by by Frankton, uh, and then I'll be presenting at the end on on the Ghana case study. So the first is Tom, um, and I'll give you a warning in the chat at five minutes. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so this paper is a sort of combined product with myself, Brooke, and Fana, um, as is the next paper, which Brooke's going to present. Um, there we go. I mean, the rationale of the paper is basically the starting point is that obviously developing countries currently face this challenge of needing to make massive investments in electricity generation in order to expand access, in order to provide energy for industrialization and so on while at the same time being constrained by um, the pressure to um, limit emissions and move into renewable technology. And Ethiopia is an interesting case in that respect in that it's uh, an example, a quite extreme example of state-led development where the government over the past three decades or more has invested very heavily in infrastructure and particularly around the, in the electricity sector. With, and in Ethiopia's case, particularly through a series of large, ever larger dams um, with hydropower forming the main um, source of electricity in the country. So essentially what the paper is trying to look at is, you know, what are the factors that shape electricity se sector planning? And in a sector where both in electricity, terms of electricity and dams, where which is you know widely acknowledged to be extremely influenced by politics and highly shaped by politics, yet is also highly technical. Um, how do you try and achieve something approaching a correct balance between the political drivers and and, and sort of technical input into into decision making? Um, I won't go very much into the theory, but I'm. The starting point that we look at is a number of recent works, which has sort of highlighted the importance of elite cohesion um, and its role for industrial policy and structural transformation. And we argue in the paper that a lot of those insights are quite relevant for infrastructure developments as well, and in particular dam projects, that the argument is that elite cohesion leads to a long time horizon, which obviously is important in terms of the electricity sector in general, but particularly dams, which have long lead times and construction times. Um, coherent development vision and the role of electricity within that, and also the idea that it, you know it allows, it allows elites to prioritise investment over the long term rather than short term consumption, um, and winning polit political support. Um, yet within that literature, there's kind of this assumption that once you have elite cohesion in place, that technical capacity will follow. That it's a fairly straightforward, you know, ultimately it's elite cohesion is the big, the big political challenge and technical capacity will one way or another follow on from that. Yet, obviously, in the electricity sector, amongst many others, it's highly technical and you know, building that capacity and actually empowering it um, within the, the decision making process is quite a challenging, complex process. So in terms of Ethiopia itself, um, the EPRDF came to power in 1991 and was in power until it was the party, the coalition was dissolved in uh, 2019. Now this paper is kind of more or less going to cover the period up until about 2015 and the one that Brooke um, will present in a moment looks at primarily at the period after then. But essentially, Ethiopia, particularly after 2001, when there was a major split in the ruling party, has been has had a very high degree of elite cohesion. Um, the, the split in the party led to Meles Zenawi, the prime minister, who's the right hand figure in the top of those photographs, assuming almost complete control. And, he, and between him and a, and, a, and a set of advisors around him, they laid out this developmental state strategy and the key role for the state within this major developmental project. 
After his death in 2012, politics in general fragmented and that elite cohesion gradually unraveled. But within the electricity sector, you know, um, control over, over decision making actually remained quite centralized for a considerable period of time. And, and the next picture down is there is uh, Debrit Sion Gavramikael, who was the leader of the Tigrayan faction um, of, of the TPLF. And as deputy prime minister for the economic side, um, with responsibility for formulating the economic part of the national development strategy. And he was also chair of the board of the electric power company. He kind of had an outside influence on, on the planning process and indeed decision making around individual projects in that period after 2012. And it's important also to sort of like reflect a bit on the, on the EPRDF's approach to development in general. First of all, with respect to sort of technical expertise. Now that this developmental state project was very much seen as a political project of this vanguard ruling party and the civil service in general, including sort of expertise within the electricity sector tended to be viewed as an obstacle that, you know, that they weren't, people weren't ambitious enough and there was a need for politicians really to push them to sort of for the step chain change in ambition that was required to really push Ethiopia into development and structural transformation of the economy. And then electricity was then seen as having a very particular, particularly important role in that whole process, underpinning the industrialization strategy. So the idea that states controlled and owned um, electricity generation and transmission would then um, subsidize manufacturing, form an industrial policy through low tariffs. Um, and yeah, that essentially the state investment in massive, massive increase in generation capacity and distribution was key to underpinning this whole economic model. And a lot of the paper looks at sort of the planning process and the sort of process of target setting and where those targets come, come from. Now this graph is a bit complicated, but essentially the red lines are the two power sector master plans um, put together in this period of the sort of first decade of the 2000s. Um, the blue, the blue, the dark blue bars are actual installed capacity. The light blue bars are um, actual peak demand, and then the orange dots are the targets in the national development strategy. So essentially, what this shows is that you know you initially in the early two thousands you had this plan to increase increase generation capacity. Um, in fa fairly to fairly modest to a fairly modest degree, so not not enormous increases. And the first national development target in two thousand and five was very cl closely aligned with the power sector master plan and was fairly easily reached with the completion of one dam project. But essentially, from the mid two thousands, there's this kind of both a, a step change in ambition and um, from the political side and a sort of a, a, a separation of the political ambition from the, from the technical planning process. So as this one quote illustrates this sort of change in ambition that we planned for 7% seven, um, 7 growth per year, but unexpectedly found 10% one year in 2014. And that demonstrated that this is possible and it should be maintained. And really from that point onwards, there was this huge um, step change in ambition and expectation of, uh, of rapid development from that period onwards. And you can see that in, in that particular target for 2010 from the National Development Plan, nearly double um, what, was, what was expected within, um, within the Power Sector Master Plan, which was the more technical assessment of what uh, prediction, prediction of what was gonna be peak demand by 2010. Um, yet in that particular instance, it was met with the completion of the Gibe 2 hydropower project and the Tekede Dam in northern Ethiopia. But subsequent to that, it all goes um, e even more um, implausible that from the two, these two graphs show the similar, similar things for the, for the next two development plans, the growth and transformation plans in from 2010 to 2020. And the basic rationale of the, from the government side is summed up by that quote that the, the targets were very high. Mellors used to say it's backbreaking, heavy investments that's required, and that we had to really push ourselves. 
and essentially the yeah the, the any any link between the technical planning process and um, and 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 um, the political targets is is clearly disappears from that point onward. So in the first graph, you've got the, the again the two thousand six master plan in the red line, which bears no resemblance to this enormous target for installed capacity on, with the orange dot, so nearly five times what what projected peak demand was going to be. Um, and as a result of the delays to the Give 3 dam and, and the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance dam, they get nowhere near that target. And then the second graph, both the technical planning process essentially becomes highly politicized and yeah, still, still that's not considered, considered ambitious enough. So essentially the master plan in 2014 was co conducted by a, a, some foreign consultants who were essentially told that they had no option but to integrate the national, the, the, the plans from the, from, the, from the previous national development plan, which was already proving to be highly unrealistic. So these enormous plans in terms of an electrified railway network, in terms of a whole series of industrial parks for operating at full capacity was used as the basis for generating those three um, projections for peak demand. So high, medium and low projection, um, which in actual fact, even the lowest projection turns out to have been um, over optimistic. But even then for Deborah Tsion, that wasn't seen as ambitious enough. So essentially what he did was to take the target for 2025 from the high, high um, projection, so the dark red line and move it five forward five years. So, you know, because we're so ambitious, we're gonna achieve the 25, 25 target by 2020 um, and demonstrate, you know, our ability to get, become a middle income country and, and, and our developmental ambitions. Now, it, this comes to, back to the question of, well, what, is ambition a good thing or a bad thing? Um, in many respects, you, you can say, well, ambition is, is all very well. It's, it, you know, if you aim high, you, you get somewhere. And that, broadly speaking, I think, was the government's strategy for much of this period. But it's also clear that there were a number of problems which came about in the electricity sector as a direct result of this planning process that one, the government focused almost exclusively on, um, ma on massive increases in generation capacity, but at the same time paid very little in attention to maintenance, transition, transmission and distribution with the result that access figures didn't actually rise very much at points. There were problems actually transmitting the electricity that was being produced. And very often as a result of poor maintenance, generation capacity was running well below what in theory was available. The master plans quickly became meaningless and una yeah, unable to provide any kind of meaningful assessment of either future demand or fu future supply because they were, you know, both, both sides of that equation were based on such unrealistic plans. And there was this massive increase in, in, in debt as a result of failure to failure to expand access, low tariffs, and this um, yeah, massive investment in, in generation capacity. And Brooke will come back to that in the next presentation. Um, and then the last one is then in terms of the individual projects themselves. I'm, I'm guessing for this audience, I probably don't need to explain the difference between power and energy, but I'm happy to come back to that in the q and if, if anyone's got questions. But essentially for the, for the politicians, they, as this quote says, they look at the size in terms of megawatts and assume that megawatts is what matters, but by increasing the installed capacity, they've just increased the unit cost of the energy. So there's this almost exclusive interest in megawatts and installed capacity within, within these planning processes. And all of those, most of the tar targets and certainly the key ones were all in terms of megawatts. And that then filtered through in terms of each of the individual projects as well, with politicians directly intervening to push um, the, the design teams to, to go for ever higher installed capacity and in the process lowering the plant factor. So these, these, these figures that are there are for the plant factors of the dams. Now for the GERD, it's often been, a, a number of people have already noted that the GERD's got quite a low plant factor by international standards and that, you know, it's not, suited to a baseload energy plant. 
But what has often been missed is that actually that was pretty typical of the whole planning process within the sector as a whole. So both the Bellas and Gile dams, the Gile three and, and are complete now. Gerd is obviously in process and Koisha, um, which is the fourth Gile dam for now remains a hole in the ground, but all of them are, yeah, quite low plant factors that very much suited to peaking plants, which is not obviously what Ethiopia needs in terms of energy generation. Um, and with a result that sort of, it's quite an inefficient way of actually producing the energy that Ethiopia requires. So I imagine I'm pretty close to time being up. Um, so essentially the conclusion is, is that the electricity sector in many ways is quite emblematic of both the successes and the failures of the EPRDF's developmental state project. There are major successes. I mean, when, he, when the EPRDF came to power, there was, its total installed capacity was 400 megawatts. And by the time it left, it was 4,000. And that's even before completion, obviously, of the GERD, which is going to massively increase it again. But at the same time, there's clearly an imbalance in this whole planning process where you've got politically driven targets, which are then undermining the, the, any, any possibility of a technocratic planning process. And indeed, the, the actual performance of the sector, which again, going back to the, to the sort of more theoretical point is that clearly elite cohesion is not enough to, for, for, um, for, for effective development processes and you know, the relationship between political elites and technocrats is also extremely important in terms of understanding how decisions get made um, within the sector. But I will stop there. Great, thanks Tom, uh, that was really interesting. So now on to Baruch to continue the story. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, let me just share my slides. Can you all see that? Is that visible? Great. Yeah. Um, when you passed, okay. So, uh, hi everyone. I uh, wasn't able to introduce myself early this morning. I came a bit late, um, but listened to most of the stuff and very exciting. Um, this is in many ways a continuation of the story that Tom just told, um, again, co-authored with, with our colleague Fana um, on, on the period post-2015. Um, and in many ways, the question we're asking here is what explains um, two particular transitions in the energy sector in Ethiopia. On the one hand, you have suddenly this, this proliferation or you know, an incremental increase in, in, in private actors that have entered the fray. Um, and at the same time, sort of diversification of the energy mix away from the, the hydro model that has dominated um, the Ethiopian electricity sector, as, as Tom has just outlined. Um, and what are the sort of the political economy uh, rationales for these shifts, uh, quite fundamental shifts in the sector? And Ethiopia is, is an interesting case study, obviously, because um, it has historically resisted pressures to liberalize the sector um, and has largely depended fully on, on hydropower. Um, so the research question we're asking here is uh, what factors explain the sort of rupture in the path dependent electricity sector in terms of state ownership and hydro dependence? Um, and, and I'll get into what I mean by path dependent in a second. Um, but yeah, as of 2015, you started to see the rise of, of public-private partnerships, um, independent power producers being included in, in various proclamations and policies. Um, and, and how does that come about politically, given the history of the EPRDF and, and the sort of ideological commitment that we had just heard about? Um, so literatures on, on sort of power sector reform and energy transitions and have historically been considered quite separately, but present related theoretical concerns. And, and one of those is, is this idea of path dependence, that um, institutional movement in a given direction induces further movement in that direction. In other words, heavy investments in, in hydropower and expertise uh, very much induces those actors to further um, invest in hydropower. Sort of the creation of self-reinforcing dynamics. Um, and, and so how do we explain the sudden shift or rupture, if you will, within the electricity sector? Um, or is it even that sudden or do we see incremental shifts that have been largely ignored within the literature? 
Um, and so we, we conceptualize this period post-2015 or actually post-2012 really when, when Mellas dies as a sort of critical juncture, um, a relatively short period of time during which there's a substantially heightened probability that agents' choices will affect the outcomes of interest. In other words, that these self-reinforcing dynamics that I was referring to earlier um, become inhibited because agents suddenly see um, alternative options. Um, and you know, his, in the literature, again, oftentimes the sort of rupture, these changing paths uh, are, are theorized as depending on um, how dependent financially a country is on the World Bank. And so if, if the world, you know, if a country is very exposed to the World Bank, then, then the imposition of the standard model within the electricity sector is, is more likely. Um, at the same time, the role of elite cohesion is often identified as a key um, point. And we, we heard about elite cohesion in the last presentation. Um, and, and we argue here really that intra-elite relations or the shift in those relations, the reconfiguration of the, of the internal politics within the EPRDF, uh, uh, the rise of a new generation of, of, of politicians um, in combination with, with a range of, of financial um, factors, which I'll get into in a second, really uh, shape um, a subsequent embrace of, of reforms in the sector. So just a very brief sort of laying of the context. Um, the EPRDF in many ways inherited quite low levels of debt from, from the Dirk. Uh, and so, you know, ELPA was, was established in 1956 uh, as a monopoly um, focused on generation transmission and distribution. Um, and then you had the Dirk, a sort of military junta that, that ran Ethiopia between 1974 and 1991, um, that very much continued uh, along those lines. And when the EPRDF comes to power in 1991, um, as I've just mentioned, they inherit quite low levels of debt from the Dirk and are therefore able and quite autonomously to, to dominate the sector. Uh, there's a continuation of low tariffs um, to subsidize industry, uh, massive state investments in generation. Um, and at the same time, there's sort of a view of the private sector um, as, as a, a parasitic rent seeker. You know, this is, this is what Mellas used to call um, particular, certain private actors to say, um, you know, I'm not interested in, in having the private sector engage in, in the generation of electricity because their discount rates are so steep that ultimately it is our population, our, our people that will suffer the cost of it. Um, and so there was very much this view of, of maintaining autonomy over the electricity sector, as well as many other sectors, but the sort of commanding heights of the economy, as he called them in particular, um, including the electricity sector, telecoms, etc. And this involved also resist, resisting donor pressure from time to time, resisting the World Bank and the IMF um, with when they came along with reforms. Um, uh, you know, as, as the quote there illustrates, you know, they told the bank, this is the extent that we can go. And if that's not enough, then we don't want your money. Very much highlighting how uh, the, the level of autonomy that the EPRD have had via via the donors. Um, but at the same time, what you saw over the you know, first 10, 15 years is that hydropower and the dependence on dams became embedded within the technocracy, uh, you know, expertise, ideological commitment, financial investments um, within the ministry, within the agencies and within, within the corporation as well. Um, and, and another quote here, water has been the message since childhood. It is what you are told in school that the country key resource is water. It comes from that mentality. This is again a senior senior official at the EPRDF uh, stating this. So you have um, you know, this huge hydro dependence in Ethiopia um, really up until 2015, um, even now, if, if you will, but would we see a slight shift. Um, but before we go into that, it's, it's sort of important to understand why the dependence on hydropower was so sustaining. You know, on the one hand, the alternatives were really not there for, for, for many reasons. So geothermal, um, you know, Ethiopia is sitting on, on some of the best hydro, um, geothermal resources worldwide, uh, according to people who are familiar uh, with that space, including one of the um, private actors now involved, but uh, has major upfront costs. So, you know, a 2.5 kilometer uh, a deep uh, exploratory, exploratory drilling um, exercise can cost up to 7.5 million US dollars. And the chances of, of not getting anything out of that are, are quite high. And so um, that was not necessarily the option for, for the EPRDF. 
wind and solar um, at the time in the early 2000s were, you know, the EPRDF lacked the expertise, as I've just said, because they'd invested so much in, in hydropower. But also the costs were, were quite high at the time until um, you know, about 10 years. But you do see um, investments in, in Adama wind farms at the bottom and at the top, that's the Tulumoye um, geothermal plant. So you see sort of attempts to, to grapple with alternatives. Um, hydropower, on the other hand, had high upfront costs, but was cheap over, over life cycle relatively. And um, again, EPRDF had planned, you know, had these 20, 30 year plans ahead of it. So in many ways, it wasn't planning to be in power for, for uh, just uh, the next five years, but really was planning along the long term. So hydropower was doing. A major factor that started uh, increasing doubts or, or shifting in, in, these, in the ideology was the, the drought in 2008 and 2009, um, where suddenly they had to fall back on largely diesel generators, which was quite costly. And so this, this really started getting certain technocrats within the ministry, but also some of the politicians thinking, OK, you know, our dependence on hydropower is, is explicit. You know, we, we've just gotten exposed to the dangers of this. Um, maybe it's time to consider alternatives. Um, but as time went on, again, uh, that thinking was eclipsed by larger dams. The Grand Renaissance Dam comes into play in 2011. There was less droughts afterwards. Um, and so again, sort of hydropower dominance uh, continues. Um, so really, 2012 is, is the sort of critical juncture. Um, where we suddenly see the rise of a political crisis, but also a debt crisis. And it's this combination that results in the shifts that I, that I will outline uh, in the next two, three minutes. Um, you know, Tom noted how Mellas had controlled the EPRDF's political apparatus after 2001. Uh, and so his death ushered in a sort of generational and ideological shift within the ruling party. Um, suddenly you had increasing debates about the role of the private sector and, and more generally, um, but also the electricity sector in particular. So at this sort of critical political juncture, uh, you see the IMF raise the assessment of Ethiopia's debt from low to moderate risk of distress, um, raising questions of how Ethiopia will service debt in light of weak, weak export growth. Um, and so the limits of this debt financed affair were becoming clearer and clearer uh, while this political crisis was, was taking place. Um, and you see this in, in the three slides here, um, you know, external debt to, uh, GDP ratio, well, well, debt to GDP ratio here almost at, at 60%, uh, dramatically increasing after 2012. Um, um, the IMF's threshold for uh, the external debt to exports ratio was, was also crossed in 2014, um, where the IMF then started raising its, its own flags and ringing the alarm bells. Uh, same with the, the debt service to export ratio. Again, another IMF threshold. Um, we don't need to get into the details of how that is calculated, but uh, suffice it to say that the IMF was um, now increasingly concerned about Ethiopia's debt levels. Um, and so to return to uh, the two quotes at the bottom of the slide, um, there was a realization within the ministries and some along the technocrats that, you know, in the, in the past, we'd be told to do something and we'd have to do it. Don't worry about finance, just build. Uh, this has changed now. We have to deal with financial issues. Um, and secondly, there's also this debt problem where we don't really have another choice but to privatize. So on the one hand, you have the sort of shift within the political um, elite. Haile Mariam Dasalin becomes new prime minister. Arkaba Kubai and others around him um, are more open to private investors, largely also in view of the industrial parks and the need to manufacture and uh, have Ethiopia enter middle income status. Uh, and you see also uh, the old guard being sidelined in many ways, those who have sort of deep ideological commitment, not only to hydropower, but also to you know, the, the, the notion of, of this being a state-led um, affair. Um, and so, you know, the period between 2014 and 2018 is, is one of massive protests in Ethiopia, which culminates in the appointment of Abiy Ahmed in 2018. Um, and in 2019, you see uh, the EPRDF uh, rename itself to the Prosperity Party, excluding the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front. To those of you who are following contemporary news, uh, you sort of see the current conflict being a, an outcome of, of, of that decision. Um, but you also see ideologically committed political elites, largely within the TPLF, but also some of their technocrats within the ministries being replaced by, by economic technocrats. And not just economic technocrats, but people with a history within the World Bank. So 
a lot of seconded uh, people, um, people that have a history of working in the World Bank now working as advisors within the Prime Minister's office. Um, a prime minister that openly says he's a capitalist, he's tired of hearing about Marx and Lenin and the history of, of Soviet uh, uh, politics. Um, and, and this quote is quite striking, actually. Um, Taking a loan from the IMF and the World Bank is like borrowing from one's mother. It is not a loan. It is not a loan. Because after they give us 1 billion bur, we will have 20, 30 years to repay 2, 3, 4%. What harm Ethiopia is borrowing from companies in some countries before borrowing from these institutions? Now, obviously, uh, Abiy Ahmed has not engaged with the critical history and literature on the World Bank or structural adjustment programs of the 90s. Um, but you see suddenly this opening up of a political space uh, emerging for the World Bank and IMF and other donors to engage Ethiopia on privatization and liberalization. At the same time, the, the debt situation almost causing a pragmatic need to look towards these institutions. And so the combination of a, of a political rupture that opens up space, but also a financial reality, a debt reality that, that required uh, alternatives. Um, so I'm almost there. Um, so yeah, you start seeing you know, the private public uh, partnerships policy emerge in 2017 and then proclamation in 2018. And this is actually right before Abiy Ahmed comes to power. And so it's, it's not as easy of a narrative to say Abiy comes to power and changes everything those considerations were already taking place. Um, but suddenly there was also an emphasis on, on, on cost recovery, on, on building dams and, and the electricity sector in general needing to think more commercially and, and less around debt. And, um, and this turned to, to private finance, you know, the suddenly the, the, the calls towards independent power producers um, also led to a switch to non-hydro renewables. Um, largely as a result of the fact that a lot of private actors were not interested in building dams. They were more interested in solar and wind. Um, and so you see that these sort of transitions towards the private sector, as well as the transition um, uh, away from the state, are very much intertwined. Um, and some in government favored these sort of uh, private-public partnerships around dams, but again, donors and the private sector were was not interested. Um, and you know, the IPPs were, were negotiated, again, donors uh, being central to that, the World Bank, um, as well as some of, some of the British financial institutions. Um, and so in 2020, a, a sort of revised proclamation allowed private sector engagement in transmission and distribution. Um, but at the same time, that has sort of institutional lock-in, that history, all those uh, technocrats who've been trained in, in hydro politics in hydropower uh, very much are critical of this and so this is an ongoing very contemporary uh, debate that we're seeing within both um, the political elite but also the, the ministries and the, the relevant agencies um, and so to conclude um, we're now you know a state hydroelectric dominated sector is now opening up both for private sector uh, activity in, term, in generation um, and uh, other renewables um, a big part of the reason for this was the indebtedness, which gave donors the leverage to push for changes. But at the same time, the sort of reconfiguration of, of the political elite, uh, the removal of the old guard opened up space for that push to work uh, because the World Bank and the IMF and others had been pushing in the past, but really it was the political rupture that, that opened up that space. Um, and at the same time, despite that opening up of, of the political space towards this transition, you still see a lot of suspicion of the private sector. Um, given the history of, of, of hydro uh, in, in Ethiopia and, and the expertise and sort of ideological commitments that still do exist. And so to what extent that transition and that shift is taking place is, is ambivalent. Um, I'll leave it there and look forward to discussing in the Q&A. Many thanks, Baruch. Uh, so now we'll move on to Frankton, who um, also, we'll continue the story of Ethiopia. Yeah, well, many thanks, uh, Barnaby. Is it possible that I can, uh, for now, just um, um, stop my video, then I can open it later because my internet is not stable? Sure, sure, that's fine. And if uh, do you have slides you want to share or? Yes, I've got slides I'm just sharing in a moment. Okay. Um, if you could all confirm, you can see them. Yes, we can see them. And I'll let you know in the chat when you have five minutes and two minutes left. Oh, okay. That's fine. Great. Thank yeah, you. good Good afternoon, uh, 
Uh, good morning or good evening, uh, depending with your location. Yeah, so my name is Franklin Chemura. Um, this is a paper that I'm presenting, obviously co-authored with um, uh, Wei Shen, um, Jacob Muliket, and Mary Bejos. So, so today we are basically going to talk about the institutional challenges uh, for greening uh, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, with a specific focus on um, on the energy sector. So I think I'm just sort of repeating what uh, the previous speakers have already said. I think the rationale comes from uh, this framing that uh, majority or most of uh, sub-Saharan African countries, they've got issues to do with sufficient as well as reliable access to uh, electricity um, supply. And in most cases has been identified as one of sort of the leading or sort of the constraining issue towards uh, effective or development or structural transformation. So in, in some cases, as well as those where there are already sort of some um, electricity provision, you know, researchers have already also identified that um, uh, the grid connections, the energy service, as well as um, even off-grid or on, uh, uh, network connected, there are issues of unreliability, um, frequent power cuts. At the end of the day, this has contributed sort of crippling of um, uh, economic um, and industrial activities. I just sort of to bring this into perspective, I think recent estimates suggest that, you know, out of the 860 million people in the world who do not have um, access to electricity, you'd find that close to 600 of those actually are from uh, from sub-Saharan Africa. But the interesting bit is that, um, I mean, of course, you know, coming from sort of these um, um, institutions, which have done a lot of research around uh, renewable energy endowment in, in, in respective African countries, they are coming up with suggestion that um, given the challenges of electricity, there is that potential that uh, renewable energy technologies can play a significant role in addressing the energy challenge. And this comes from some recent estimates suggesting that, for example, if we look at wind resources, you know, where it's estimated that, you know, um, Sub-Saharan Africa has close to 180,000 terawatt hour, um, as well as close to around 600,000 terawatt hour of solar, which is sort of more than enough um, to actually provide or supply electricity um, in, in the continent. But on a more interesting note, um, what we have also what we have also seen, especially um, I think between 2010 and 2018, we've seen that if you consider or if we check the amount of investments which have been made um, in the in the energy sector in sub-Saharan Africa, we can see that close to 100 billion has been committed. But interestingly, out of this 100 billion, we can see only um, uh, close to 13 billion has been committed towards uh, renewables. And then the question is that why is this the case that there isn't that much commitment? towards uh, developing uh, renewable energy. But interestingly, what we have seen is that in sub-Saharan Africa, of, often, you know, there are notable uh, issues to do with access to finance to develop these renewables, as well as issues to do with um, uh, the technology, as well as the capabilities um, for most of these African um, 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 electricity or energy ministries to deploy these renewables. And, um, and in view of this, we have seen that China has been identified, particularly by sub-Saharan um, African governments, you know, as an appropriate and to some extent, some referring to the Chinese as all weather friends. And the fact that they have been experiencing almost similar challenges uh, with regards to access to uh, energy, then definitely the Chinese could play a, a, a very important role um, in developing uh, sub-Saharan Africa renewable energy. But if we do assess the sort of the scope of, of, of and the magnitude of Chinese involvement uh, in Africa's um, power sector, we can see that um, um, especially between 2003 and 2023, uh, we are using the uh, database from um, uh, the recently commissioned from Boston University in partnership with the China Africa Research Initiative, where we can see that hydropower indeed has really dominated um, 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 Chinese operations in Africa compared to wind, which is um, about like 690. Of course, the dominance here coming from um, 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 Ethiopia and to some extent South Africa. Even when you compare the solar as well, by the way, this is at utility level. We can see that um, the Chinese footprint, particularly in solar, is, is very is very low, and this prompts us to sort of ask this question: sort of what, what why is this this case? Are there some institutional challenges specifically affecting uh, scalability of Chinese renewable energy activities um, 
um, in, in Africa. What we can see, of course, we have seen that um, the Chinese um, who have been involved in wind and solar, they have more or less been involved in, under this EPC and uh, sort of financing uh, structures or project development models. But how 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 would this be uh, in, in the future is something that we don't know, at least for now, but it would be inter interesting to understand. So what the challenge, what are the challenges affecting affecting this? So in terms of trying to look at this, therefore, we thought probably it would be good if we try to analyze the institutional challenges from both the Chinese as well as the African side to establish um, those challenges. And we thought of sort of starting from the Chinese side, looking at um, sort of who's involved actually in, 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 in the power sector in Africa. Of course, there are several institutions here um, and institutional actors uh, from government officials and, and ministries, as well as uh, Chinese development banks, as well as the state owned enterprises and private enterprises that are actually involved in developing these projects. But the problem is how do these, com uh, how do this sort of this community of, from the Chinese side actually interact and how do they actually work? How are these actors communicating and interacting in developing these projects? Who is responsible for making decisions around development of these projects? And what are the rules and norms that in most cases shape these um, uh, projects? And at the end of the day, how do these Chinese um, institutional actors interact with um, uh, host countries in developing um, renewable energy projects? So in terms of thinking about uh, our analysis here, we sort of, sort of you know, are looking at institutional actors and institutional analysis where we first try to understand sort of what are the beliefs and norms that in most cases shape the interaction uh, between these two sets of institutions, obviously from African as well as um, uh, from, 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 uh, from the Chinese side. And some of these, you know, what are the discourses shaping around development of renewables? And in most cases, what should come first? And some sort of suggesting this climate discourses, you know, should climate change be the first priority? Obviously this comes from the assumption that most in particular of the state owned enterprises, have been more or less involved in developing uh, fossil fuels as well as uh, large hydro, which has brought some controversies around in environment and social impacts. Then in terms of thinking about as well as the in institutional environment, we start questioning, you know, um, what are the governance modalities of developing the, these, uh, these renewable energies? And do they prefer to have sort of centralized uh, approaches? Uh, do they also assume that going for direct negotiation on project delivery is best than as compared to competitive or auction-based uh, um, uh, project delivery uh, mechanisms. But we're also interested in knowing the transaction in terms of the screening of these projects and under what consideration are such um, uh, projects then uh, deemed uh, fundable or, you know, authorization or, you know, obviously including issues of uh, risk, um, et cetera. And then what I can quickly say uh, specifically about um, the institutions that are involved um, from the Chinese uh, side. So what we want to drive home is that there is this idea of institutional vacuum and fragmentation, specifically from Chinese side around um, uh, development of renewable energy projects. So this institutional vacuum and fragmentation, we argue, to some extent uh, contributes to um, uh, uh, sort of um, limited uh, uh, number of Chinese uh, sort of it, it contributes to uh, constraining scalability of Chinese um, activities or operations in renewable energy projects um, in, in the continent. And um, obviously, we have got the Ministry um, of Commerce here, which in most cases is involved uh, probably in the overseas construction projects. And then we have the NR uh, NDRC with sort of also guiding and sort of feedbacking around uh, direct investment in this overseas. But equally, we also have the Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, which is sort of more or less um, involved around foreign aid and diplomacy and how projects actually are sort of constituted in this um, ministry's um, sort of diplomatic and geostrategic ambitions and goals. And then we have the Minister of Finance, uh, more or less interested in you know um, uh, the financial aspect of these projects, uh, looking at the performance as as well as asset management. And I mean, beyond this, we also have other institutions such as the Ministry of um, Environment and now the recently uh, created the Development Cooperation. But what we can uh, sort of say by carefully analyzing these um, institutions, um, specifically in the following case studies that I'm going to talk about, uh, which is Ethiopia and South Africa, we have seen that there are sort of no sectoral based target and planning around development of renewable energy in overseas. Of course, they have 
domestically, but in terms of um, the foreign or overseas market, such sort of sectoral based planning, um, at least from our investigation, seems to be absent. And again, um, again, we also have witnessed um, uh, that in terms of project approval, you know, especially around uh, wind and solar, they should carry some sort of political um, sort of, you know, uh, um, sort of instrumentalization in the sense that if they develop that project, what political as well as um, what political goals or you know interest that that project actually advance, and in most cases we have seen that projects that do not advance such you know rarely get approval uh, with that regard. And at the end of the day, we also realize that in most cases, uh, implementation of these projects actually done by state uh, by by state enterprises or the project developers who in most cases, you know, do not have sort of some uh, interaction with the corresponding institutions in the host countries. And because of this, then it contributes to this vacuum, um, um, institutional vacuum and fragmentation on uh, project development, thereby um, constraining or challenging scalability of Chinese renewable energy projects um, in Africa. Um, then we have development financial institutions, uh, these are Chinese ones, which are then therefore given the sort of um, institutional vacuum uh, from the state actors, we have seen this trying to sort of fill this gap, um, and in most cases they are involved in trying to sort of um, screen this project as well as selecting, um, obviously they take into consideration, you know, um, the financial availability of this project, and um, of course, there are some political economic drivers around decision making for this project, but they tend to take a more technical um, sort of decision making um, approaches towards um, 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 uh, development or involvement in this project. But the interesting bit in most cases about these development finance institutions, they always say issues, for example, to do with environmental and social impacts. In most cases, they are not part and parcel of their own consideration around decision making. Rather, I think partly comes from their experiences of dealing um, uh, with African uh, countries in the sense that they tend to delegate that responsibility to the host countries. Um, uh, but what we can conclude is that um, these development financial institutions, I think increasingly they are becoming ambivalent and becoming as well as assertive um, uh, towards renewable energy projects vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, conventional, um, uh, conventional energy projects, because for them, they have this assumption and belief that um, conventional energy projects, including hydro, they're always easy to get support around, uh, even from um, sort of Chinese top, um, uh, for example, state council and other uh, key decision makers. Uh, we have a number of uh, sort of state owned enterprises that are actually involved in sort of um, operations or implementation of these projects. And um, I think in the energy sector at the moment, we have about like big form um, from state owned enterprises, but equally, there are also other private um, um, uh, or, um, owned enterprises um, being involved in the sector. And in most cases, they tend to cover all or uh, any sectors from renewable to non-renewable. And the way they interact with the host institution in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa is for uh, what they refer to as demand-driven um, approach in project development. So in other words, the respective African countries should be the one uh, doing the project initiation um, around this. Um, I'm just seeing an indication in the chat. Is it a timer or, uh, okay. All right, thanks. I wasn't checking, sorry, but. Yeah, um, let me just try to. Okay. Um, so, so what 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 we can say about um, um, from from the Chinese side of the argument is that there is still this idea of fragmentation around institutions, specifically from the government, who are actually involved in in, in this project, and still there's sort of this limited limited um, uh, uh, power to make decision because in most cases that is uh, delegated to the um, uh, to the sort of the business communities who are actually involved in um, uh, developing these projects. Um, in terms of the finance side, we see that the project screening processes is well, and in most cases, it's all about risky and the uh, viability from a financial perspective of these projects. I just wanted to quickly sort of um, have um, a discussion on, on the case studies to also establish sort of what are these institutional challenges from the African side. And we had uh, Ethiopia and South Africa uh, as case studies, but I'm just checking the time here, I'm left with two minutes. So I think um, some of the things then I can sort of um, I, I discuss in the Q&A if that's fine, Banvi. Um, yeah. Yeah, you have uh, 30 seconds left on the... <laughs> All right, so let me just quickly uh, go to my conclusion anyway. Um, um, all right. 
Okay, uh, so so what we can conclude basically is that um, uh, Chinese overseas energy activities in most cases are driven by what we refer to as enclosed police community, which in most cases is comprised by key ministries as well as development finance and um, state owned enterprises. These in most cases have got the decision to decide which project goes and which doesn't. Uh, we understand that although we consider it as stable, but we still believe it's still very rigid to an extent that it's even not passing up with some of the institutional changes or reforms happening um, in, in Africa. And if I had sort of spoken about Ethiopia and South Africa, I would have sort of mentioned those institutional changes and how they are affecting the Chinese operation. Now, for example, you know, the issue of debt, which had been mentioned in the pre by the previous speaker and how the Ethiopian government then is moving from this EPC sort of um, uh, and financing models of project delivery to more of this auction based or competitive uh, tenders and stuff. And we have increasingly seen from our Greg, that the Chinese actually, they are finding it difficult to be involved in these sort of tenders and um, for, for a variety of reasons, which I can pick up in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the Q&A. What we conclude therefore, because of these constraints, you know, this at the end of the day contribute to sort of limited scalability of Chinese um, um, renewable energy activities um, in, in, in Africa. I think I'll just end then most of the things I think I can pick up on the Q&A. Sorry for going above board in terms of time. Great, no, that, was, that wasn't too far over time. Um, yeah, thanks very much for that very interesting presentation, sort of filling in uh, the international side of, of uh, two more national uh, focused case studies. So now I'm going to present mine, um, which is on Ghana. So Tom's going to police me, uh, but I'll, I'll try to keep the time of my own thing here. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm also part of the Future Dams project, for those who don't know. And I, my presentation today builds on uh, that presented earlier by uh, Simon, but here focusing more on the, the generation side and particularly thinking about um, the application of the standard reform model and the idea of the good governance agenda um, in Ghana, how it's been applied and how it contrasts with a more sort of heterodox understanding of the political settlement there. And in particular, I, I'll focus on two sort of key uh, rationales or, or sort of factors that, that affect the electricity system. One is a sort of politics of survival around uh, short term, electrically focused policymaking in a very highly competitive and strongly centralized environment. And the second is that the role of ideas and ideology, which uh, sometimes, well, at particular moments in, in uh, Ghana's policymaking have uh, created, have, have had a, a strong influence. In this case, um, a sort of underlying high modernist idea of development has helped rationalize an idea of an exponential increase in electricity generation, um, which is to, to be pursued regardless of demand. So, I'm sure for this audience, a lot of a standard reform model is and a good governance agenda is, is very familiar, but just to sort of give a, a brief outline, it's rooted in the work of, of George North and New Institutional Economics, which had an idea that the 1980s structural adjustment plans needed to factor in politics to a greater extent. Um, and, and their solution to this was to really focus on institutions, particularly formal democratic institutions and, um, and markets. So, the idea of sort of adding in this institutional focus and, and the incentives there would help uh, get the reforms right. In the electricity sector, this, uh, was, this, this application is called the standard reform model and can be sort of roughly summarized as um, a real focus on regulated transparent tariff setting on the unbundling of the different functions of the electricity system. So the generation, then the transmission, the distribution and the commercializing of those different functions ultimately into private utilities, uh, for example, independent power producers, with then markets uh, governing each of those stages of the electricity system. That then all gets underpinned by independent regulation and, and legislation. And so this recent uh, World Bank report sort of ha has a diagram which, which sums up some of the rationales involved here. But essentially, it's, its idea is that uh, market mechanisms um, 
can generate the best accountability, can generate the most efficient allocation of resources and therefore the best performance, most cost, most cost effective, most uh, efficient outcomes. But uh, this, this model, the, the good governance applications uh, to the electricity sector hasn't had a lot of success uh, uh, either on, on the more economic side or on the political side. And so there's been an evolution of thinking in, in the last uh, five to 10 years, um, which Hazel Gray calls new, new institutional economics. And so this sort of adapts the existing theory by focusing or sort of appreciating the role of the state to a greater extent, the importance of, of understanding politics. And in the electricity sector, this has uh, this sort of evolution has can be seen to some extent. Um, in, in some recent work by the bank and, and other um, academics, but has tended to manifest in, in a relatively similar focus to that earlier good governance period, where again, the, um, the, a lot of emphasis is placed on, on democratic institutions, on, on relatively formal sort of governance and regulatory uh, processes. And, and the idea that um, the presence of democracy or the presence of decentralization uh, helps unlock and enable uh, the reform model to, to work. And so in the paper, I argue that this profoundly, the, this, the underpinning theory here profoundly contrasts with the way in which power manifests, political power manifests in, in Ghana. Um, and the first sort of key idea here is that in Ghana, there's a very strong informal constant, uh, formal um, processes by which decision-making happens. And that informal power, as well as formal power, is very highly concentrated on the presidency. And so the idea of, of independent regulation, even the idea of rule, the rule of law, to some extent, uh, is, is limited. Those, those um, things that appear to exist on paper uh, don't happen in reality. Um, and as Simon was saying in that earlier presentation as well, the power is highly, highly competitive. And, and this has a long history in Ghana, going back to a pre-independence period, where you had different um, ideas of also different groups of, of, uh, of people in the country who had contrasting ideas of, of how it should uh, the country should be governed. And this has now manifested into two political parties over the last 30 years, the National Democratic Congress on the one hand and the National Patriotic Party on the other. And what's interesting is, is as Simon was saying, there's, there's a strong um, competitiveness within those, those, those parties, as well as between those parties. And so in many ways, this seems to fit what uh, Mushtaq Khan calls the competitive clientelist state. Um, uh, and there's been a, a number of scholars, both uh, Ghanaians, such as Kojo Asante or Abdul Ghaffar Abdulali, um, and, and others such as Giles Mohan or Lindsay Whitfield, who have studied this and, and used that political settlement framework to explain the politics of, of the country. Um, but today I'm, I'm not going to be follow, following a sort of uh, the classic political settlements analysis, um, uh, partly because I'm not doing a sort of long durée of the electricity sector, but also because I don't want to just sort of pigeonhole Ghana in a, a particular uh, box and, and rather reflect some of the, the dynamism that you see in the empirics but also because I want to stress the importance of ideas and ideology at, at the particular moment in, in Ghana. And um, to illustrate uh, the, these, these sort of points about how, how, how power manifests and the contrast between this more heterodox understanding of, of the country's political economy um, versus that of the standard reform model, I'm going to look at two particular power crises in the country. Uh, the first of a power shortage, which was in, in Ghana called Dumso. The second, um, a, an uh, oversupply crisis, which created a lot of debt. So this first one, the Dumso power shortage crisis, started on the 27th of August in 2012, when a small group of pirates triggered the first of two major power crises in Ghana. Attempting to escape from the Togolese Navy on a captured oil tanker, the pirates left the ship's anchor trailing. And this broke the West African gas pipeline, which transports gas from Nigeria uh, to Ghana, sparking a major fuel so shortage. And that combined with a drought um, to, to really plunge the crisis, the, the country into, into a prolonged crisis for four years. But that crisis was then quickly replaced in 2016 by one of overabundance. Um, Ghana went on a power construction overdrive between 2014 and 2016, signing 43 deals with private companies uh, in what's called take or pay contracts that involve uh, 
um, the offtake of a, the electricity company of Ghana having to pay for 90% of the power they make available, regardless of whether it was used. And this is a crisis because um, it had a costly bill. And you can see here this, this huge increase in power versus demand. And that meant that Ghana was having to pay for all of this power without actually being able to, to sell it. Um, and in 2018, this reached uh, four to five percent of uh, GDP of estimated by the bank, and, and that's only increased over time. So how to explain these crises? Uh, Ghana has in many ways been one of the more, the better sort of adopters of the standard reform model in Africa. And so if it was to work anywhere, surely it would be here. It's, it's unbundled its, its, uh, its sector so that there's different utilities for those different functions. It's introduced um, the private sector through IPPs. Uh, it also has independent planning and it also has a, another independent regulator who's supposed to um, set the tariffs. So surely it should be working here. Well, um, I, I argue that although there was some immediate uh, external causes for the Dumsor crisis, the breaking of a gas pipeline and, and a drought, those aren't enough to explain why the crisis lasted quite so long. Um, they, those issues were largely fixed by, uh, by in, within a few years and, and also the, the country's installed capacity increased during that four-year power crisis. And so to understand that, you have to understand why the capacity that it was online, that was, that was there, was not uh, functioning, was not running. And there, the answer is, is basically that it was in thermal generation and there wasn't enough fuel for those thermal plants. Why wasn't there enough fuel? Well, there doesn't seem to have been enough money. Uh, ECG was, had uh, significant debt and wasn't able to pay the power producers to, to buy the fuel to do the generation. Why was there not enough money? Well, that is rooted in the country's competitive politics. Um, after there was an election in 2012, elections in Ghana are very expensive because of that competitiveness, both, as I was saying, within the party and between the parties. And so the, the government has spent a lot of money in that 2012 election. After the election, there was a deficit and they stopped or they, they didn't pay their full bills for the electricity that the state was consuming. So that was the first problem. The second problem is one to do with tariffs. And uh, here, um, the, the key thing to understand is that although the tariffs are supposed to be set independently, that informal concentration of power means that essentially the president can decide uh, what the tariffs are and frequently intervenes in that tariff setting process. So that you've only had very short periods where, there, where there's been a sort of strong technocratic uh, setting of tariffs and, and they've automatically increased. The result is that tariffs aren't sufficient to cover the system's costs. So again, you have another issue around there being insufficient money in the system to, to pay for it to work. Um, and so, yeah, the result is therefore there wasn't there enough money to buy the fuel to, to run the plants and you had this long crisis. Um, but, but the two crises are, are then related. Why do you then have an oversupply crisis immediately after this, un, this, uh, this shortage? Well, one of the reasons is, is uh, that there seems to have been a significant degree of, of panic in the run up to that 2016 election, which led to an overreaction by the state. The, re the, the, the need to sort of uh, respond to these huge protests in the country, uh, what some people call Ghana's first um, middle class revolution, where the slogan, no power, no vote, became, became a, a very popular. The need to respond to that led to, um, in part, a, a decision to implement a, a target that had been decided, in, uh, decided earlier to have 5,000 megawatts in the country by 2020. And so there was this rush to sign power plants. But that panic isn't the only explanation. Another one is related to rent seeking. Um, given the expensiveness of elections, as I was saying, there's a real incentive for those involved in the electricity system to try and make money where possible. And in these power sector contracts, it was very uh, easy for politicians to partner with the countries involved. The, the contracts had to go through parliament. And so politicians were able to, to use those deals to accrue political finance for them to, to defend their power. Uh, as one interviewee said, all of the cabinet had uh, their finger in that pie. 
But I argue that there is another influence which is somewhat overlooked, um, one of uh, one more of more a more ideological one, and and the key uh, question to ask here is why that five thousand megawatt plan existed before all of these crises happened. Well, uh, the answer seems to lie in the manifesto that the NDC drew up in in twenty uh, in two thousand and eight, um, which involved a, a large industrialization plan. And despite um, Ghana's uh, checked, checkered history of, of trying to do industrialization uh, since the 1990s and since it, be it became a democracy, despite the, the huge international barriers um, and infrastructural barriers, even the cost of electricity being a barrier to, to industrialization happening, uh, there was a sense that this, um, this plan should go ahead anyway and that therefore there needed to be an accompanying power sector plan. Um, and, and some are similarly to Ethiopia, but there was an idea that this should come regardless of any signs of demand, regardless of any, any uh, signs that this industrialization was taking off. The sort of build it and they will come, build the power first and, um, and this will generate uh, the industrialization. And so I argue that in the paper that this particular high modernist influence uh, was was important in this particular um, moment of oversupply crisis. So I, what does this all show? Well, I, for one, it, it really indicates the importance of analyzing the manifestation of political power and how in Ghana um, uh, that, that power was able to overwhelm the institutions of the standard reform or the, the attempted changes of the standard reform model. That independent regulation, and planning of a sector, the commercial relationships that, was, that were supposedly established and there on paper um, were, were, were overcome by the, the rationales for short-term competitive um, uh, election-focused decision-making. And combining that with then an understanding of, of a way ideology um, can appear uh, to influence particular decision-making then helps explain uh, this, this outcome. And so the, the, the paper version of this is on the Future Downs website and then hopefully it will become an article shortly. But thanks very much.